Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. Today I have a presentation for you on uh, some research uh, about uh, how professional and proper evaluation of speakers done um, in the uh, industry and for research. Uh, motivations come from a um, number of uh, videos and blog posts uh, by traditional magazine reviewers and the like. Uh, each one trying to defend their uh, turf, and the turf being that the classic uh, reviewer of, of uh, speakers and, to some extent, uh, headphones, uh, wants to defend this, what they call subjective reviewing, which is get a pair of speakers, set them up in their rooms, listen to it, and give you the impression. And uh, many are defending that, uh, saying this is the right thing to do, and uh, they're actually going a step further, saying that if you're aware of measurements, uh, when you uh, evaluate the speaker, you're actually less scientific at that, what they're doing by implication, by not looking at measurements or you know, conveniently not caring about measurements, that somehow they have, uh, they're speaking more of a truth about uh, the performance of a speaker. And uh, one of the things about those videos and blog posts is that they usually are devoid of any research or any, anything to back what their point of view is. They're just appealing to your gut. And what I just said probably makes sense to you, reviewer. We'll go get a uh, speaker, turn them on, listen to them, give you impression. And uh, why is their opinion correct? Well, because they've been doing this for years and years, and that uh, they're more of an expert than uh, you and I are because they've been doing that work, and therefore they can give you a, a more correct opinion. Um, uh, I wanted to to dig into that, but unlike their approach, I want to actually show you the research and explain how uh, we go about this field, how do you evaluate speakers, and, uh, and it's a topic that I don't think people are familiar with. At high level, you probably have heard some of the buzzwords like blind testing and control testing, but I don't think the details are known. So hopefully you get some good insight into how the research approaches this topic, and then I'll bring it down to earth to you know, the topic at hand, which is, um, you know, are reviews of speakers trustworthy and what is the proper way to approach this, what I call difficult topic. So let's get right into it. Um, let me start at the beginning. When I decided to get into speaker testing and reviewing about two years ago and bought the Clipple near field scanner, I was actually quite concerned. Um, it's one thing to have an electronic product and uh, you measure it and the measurements are very, very powerful and conclusive and they're done electronically so they have very high accuracy, far better than our ears. It's completely another to, you know, have judgment on a speaker. Um, I'll explain a little bit later that we do have powerful tools as far as measurements that help with loudspeaker evaluation, but ultimately, you know, this big responsibility was on my shoulder of if I got into this, how would I rank speakers? How would I rate them? How would I be able to defend that? Uh, and uh, I, I didn't have a great idea beyond the good measurements at that time and, and uh, stumbled on a process of, of getting a good idea. And I'll talk about that in my approach at the end of this presentation. But before I do, let me just say that it is a hard thing. Um, I don't think anybody in the world, with all the research behind you, you could 100 some percent prove that this is the best speaker or is this the third best speaker. Um, it's a tough, tough thing. Now, what makes it tough is that there is no reference. Um, right now you're listening to me on whatever headphone or speakers you're listening to. Uh, do you think it sounds like me? You don't know, right? Um, even I don't know that I sound like me because what I hear is not the same as what the microphone is recording. Um, nothing is conveyed in this recording to you as to how my voice is sounding right now in this room. That if you were here and then you went and listened to the recording, they would sound identical, right? And by definition, this is a broken architecture. The delivery system can have one tonality, which the talent and the producer and the label approve in the case of music and in case of movies, the, you know, the director and what have you. They, they approve the sound in a specific listening environment, a professional listening environment usually. And then they hand you this recording and then you listen to it. And we all aspire for this high fidelity goal of hi-fi. Yet we have no reference. And if you don't have a reference, how do you know something is, is correct? Um, if I have this uh, shade of red in here, uh, how do you know this is correct red? Uh, likely this red won't 
look the same as it's looking to me on my professional monitor. If you just have a consumer device, that red may be a completely different shape, uh, different uh, tonality. Um, but let's talk about that in both uh, photography and, and video where this problem was nailed and solved and defined day one as part of the architecture. So what I have in here is called the Simpty Color Bars. Um, that's Society of Motion Pictures and Television Engineers. They set a standard and this is a set of colors. So if you take this and you put it in, in a recording device and you capture that and you calibrate the uh, recording system to be correct, each one of these colors has a specific measured value. And then you give that recording to somebody and they also calibrate their television or display device to the exact same color values, again, we're using a measurement, then the two shades of red are gonna be as good as the measurements will tell you they are. And if they tell you that they're you know, accurate within you know, point 0.1 digit, that's what you have. You know, your uh, red is not gonna look orange all of a sudden. Uh, your dynamic range, different shades of, of gray, for example, that can be calibrated and, and so forth. And in the old days, this was a huge problem. Today, displays have made massive progress, even out of box, you know, uh, mass consumer devices do well because, partly because it's people measured it and people can, can find out if these things are accurate or not. Uh, likewise, in photography, we can have this Mac Macbeth color chart and there are different versions of this with, with different pictures. And uh, you can have this and you can take a picture of it and then you can print it and you can compare the print to the real thing. And the two can be compared to get accuracy. So it's what I call end-to-end -end calibration. So you calibrate the source to it specific standard and calibrate the target to a specific standard and then you're done so there's no food fights we don't have the fights that we have in audio and video because you know it displays either accurate or it's not accurate you know you can stop it and measure a frame and still frame and make measurements and if it's way off it's way off uh you know you can't argue with that uh, not, there are food fights in that world also as far as the display technology what have you but nowhere near what we have in audio because we have that reference in um, audio we don't have that in music we don't have that uh, even sound for video we don't have that uh, we have it for the video portion but we don't have it for the uh, sound portion um, to give you an extent of the, how bad the problem is um, general I guess top three brands uh, in the world as far as uh, professional monitors. Uh, each monitor that they produce, they measure at the factory, and they have the measurements actually they keep, and then they uh, send it out to people that want to buy them to use them for professional applications. So General like did a study of their customers. Uh, this is in... Uh, in the context of movies, and they went out and, and did measurements in here, and uh, you can see the incredible variations between the minimum and maximum variations. We have rooms in here that are minus 20 dB, and then we have rooms here that are plus 10 dB. So there's 30 dB variation uh, in here in base frequencies alone. Excuse me. Um, got a little bit better in the mid bands, but then it spreads out again in, in higher frequencies. So the music that you listen to, the movie soundtrack that you listen to, may have been mixed on any of these curves. And these are summary curves, by the way, not the individual curves. You know, these are means and averages and so forth. But you know, each one may have landed somewhere else. And when they were mixing this music or, or movie soundtrack, if their bass was this hot, they may have produced it with less bass. Or if their bass that they were hearing was this low, then they were pulling it up to listen to. Uh, worse yet, the, and this is for the movie industry, they use this one-third octave calibration from this old Dolby standard that's just badly broken. And that one-third uh, octave filtering has actually smoothed the heck out of these uh, graphs in reality. You know, it's actually a lot worse than this. So. There is no truth in production, and you know that, right? You listen to some music and it'll be bass heavy or it'll be too bright or it could be anything, right? The track to track, the tonality of, of sound changes. So this creates a big problem for us, which is, uh, you know, if I want to objectively analyze uh, the sound of a speaker and uh, have you listen to it, you know, and I play some music. I mean, uh, you know, that's the that's the material we want to know how it sounds, right? I take a track and I play it, and uh, let's pick Tracy Chapman is one of the common research tracks. And so you listen to Tracy Chapman, uh, and you listen to it on one speaker. Uh, now what? What are you going to say? Oh, it has too much bass? Too much bass relative to what? Are the vocals forward? 
forward relative to what? How do you know what Tracy Chapman's voice is like, A, and how was it recorded? Maybe it was recorded with too much bass or too little bass and too little highs or too much highs or was perfectly normal. How do you solve this problem? Well, until about 30, 40 years ago, it was assumed that this was not a solvable problem, that uh, every speaker is a shot in the dark. And oh, by the way, there was an assumption made that all of us have different tastes. And uh, there was this art in a gray haired guy who sat there and designed the speaker to uh, come up with a sound that people liked. Um, all this changed when Dr. Toole arrived at National Research Council in Canada, which is a research facility set up to encourage different industries in Canada, and audio was one of them. And uh, he set out to find out if, you know, what can we find out why people like certain speakers more than the other? And he quickly realized that, you know, the way you solve this puzzle isn't by just listening to one speaker and having somebody give a score to it, but that you compare two, three, or four speakers against each other. And an interesting thing happens when you do that. When you compare three speakers, two of them will have similar bass, and then one of them will have too much or too little bass, or too much or too little Twitter uh, response to treble. And your brain at that point becomes calibrated. It says, wait a second, these two sounded right to me, and they're more common, and this is the one that's standing out. And the more of these you have, when you go to four, that even gets better. Now you have four alternatives. So if two of them by chance couldn't be both broken the same way and giving you that reference, now it's four. So chances of you know accidental matching with two broken approaches uh, gets much lower. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, that was the trick that solved this problem. So you listen to speaker A, speaker B, speaker C, and speaker D, and you rate all four of them. And only then can you determine which one of these speakers sounds better in what way, which one has better bass, mid-range, treble, and what have you, because it's this reference. Now, I'm telling you what the research is, but I can tell you also personal experience. I've been fortunate enough to go to Harman uh, twice and sat in their shuffler and the control blind test. And I remember hearing the first speaker ever in that test, and it's all blind, there's a curtain, you can't see anything, and the first speaker played, and they give you a score sheet, one to 10, you're supposed to give a number. And there's no other instruction, by the way, you decide what quality means. You're, you're giving it one for a horrible speaker, and 10 for 10, you can imagine any scenario you want in your head of what is quality, closer to life, uh, whatever, it's up to you. And I was like, okay, is this a four, is it a three, is there a two, is there a six, is it a ten? What, you know, what number do I give to the speaker? And I was totally lost till a few seconds later, speaker switched and to a different speaker, and all of a sudden I said, wow, this, this speaker sounds so much better than the last one. Let me go back and scratch the first one and give it a much lower score because now this is good. And then the next speaker, by the way, sounded very similar to this. And it actually was a tough thing. I was like, I think I gave one a six and a seven. It was very hard to decide between those two. But this, the odd man out was very easy to identify in contrast because I heard C and B and C and it was very clear. And those two immediately sort of uh, aligned with my mental view of what sound should be, but it took that sharp comparison in situ, in place, um, and a switching time that was about four or five seconds it takes for the speaker shuffler, uh, pneumatic speaker uh, shuffler they have at Harman to switch speakers and always then keeps the speaker listened to in, in the right place. And that gets me to the second part of this thing. For this testing to work, speakers need, uh, the testing needs to be blind and it needs to be randomized. Uh, randomized part I'll get to in a second. But it needs to be blind because when I took this test, the first one, first speaker was a plain um, uh, uh, electrostatic speaker. And the other one was a horn speaker. And the third one was a very attractive consumer speaker. So I'll tell you the brand, brands, Martin Logan, um, uh, JBL, and BMW. If you look at those three speakers, no way can you put aside your mental judgment of what speaker is, that the look and the design of those three speakers. I mean, the BMW with his Twitter on top, it looks so iconic. JBL has a horn, so if you don't like horns, you immediately say, wow, that's gonna sound horny. And, uh, <laughs> excuse the term, and the Martin Logan, you know, with the electrostatic panel and the subwoofer underneath, it's like, 
you know, depending on what you're a fan of, what good uh, impressions you've had in the past, it quickly colors your view of, of that world. So we want to not have that. We want to just judge the sound. So, you know, curtains put in front, uh, acoustically transparent black uh, fabric is in front so you can't see the speakers. And now you have to judge it on, on that basis. The randomized part is that, and I'll talk more about this later on, that we're going to do a statistical analysis of what, are, what is real data and what is noise, what's variability. And tons of uh, fundamentals of statistics relies on, on samples to be random. Uh, if I want to do a drug study and uh, I only go pick females and not any males, well, then it's only representing females and not males. Uh, you want to have a randomized study where randomized selection of those where you have X mix of you know, males and females in there, if that's what you, uh, you're trying to represent the whole. So you don't want your sample to be you know, a specific sample, you want to be able to randomize this. So when you listen, when you sit through the testing, um, the order of the speakers that you listen to is randomized, so they're not one following the other one always. That can have a strong effect. And you don't know which speaker is playing when. And different tracks are played and different order of speakers is presented to you. Another track plays, different order again. And if another track is played, different order again. So this randomization is key. It's not just, you know, I always compare Martin Ogun to BMW in that sequence. That screws up all those statistical analysis and messes things up. Um, so right away, we can tell there's a problem with the typical magazine reviewers says, oh, I'm doing things scientifically because I don't look at measurements. Like, no, you're looking at the brand, the, the color, the design, the designer. You probably had, you know, two hour conversation or you knew the designer, you don't know the designer. Products from China, from England or from US, from Germany. All that stuff heavily influences the impression people have of sound. And uh, uh, from that point of view, it, it really, you can't talk about the word scientific the moment you look at these things and uh, pass judgment. Now, this one I've covered on the third one. It's very controversial for people who haven't looked at the research, but uh, the focus of everything I'm talking about right now is on tonality. Tonality by far sets the preference for a speaker. Get the tonality wrong in control testing, and I don't care what else you talk about, you know, distortion or imaging and what have you. They're all distant second and third. Um, naturally, the speaker has to sound right. If it's too bright, you know, what do I care about what the imaging is like or how loud it can play? It's too bright. So... Research has shown that for us to analyze the tonality of a speaker, a single speaker listened to in mono configuration, by far gives you the um, easiest situation for you to judge. The moment you make it stereo, it drops like a cliff where the bad and a good speaker are judged almost close to each other. And by the time you go to 5.1, which is one of the configuration tests, essentially uh, the crappy ones and, and the great ones sound the same to most people. Uh, ask Bose, you know, with acoustic mass with the little speakers, 5.1 and a subwoofer. Tons of people will listen to that, so it sounds wonderful. You know, it sounds great, you know, because... It's, it's a surround and gives you that impression. So I have another dedicated video on that. I know a few people disagree with that, but just trust me. This is the way research is done for 40 years. Harman has a room that can do 5.1 shuffling of speakers. They don't do it, not because they can't, but because it just produces less accurate results. And, you know, as it is, this job is hard. Why would we want to make the job harder on listeners? <laughs> Let's make the job easier on them. Listen to one speaker, whatever tonality it has is the same as having two speakers generating the same tonality. So that's what we care about. So you got to use single speaker. When was the last time you saw a, a subjective reviewer listen to one speaker? Never. If you tell them that, they think it's sacrilegious. Why? Because they've not just studied one paper on how proper analysis of speaker tonality is done in research for 40 years. So they think you have to listen to stereo and you have to wax poetic about imaging and this and that. No, you want to tell me how the speaker sounds. You want to tell me the tonality is correct. You better use a single speaker and you better do your testing in mono. By the way, mono doesn't mean that you mix the music to mono. Most music these days, at least the music I listen to, is produced where the two speakers mostly have the same content. So for my types of playlist, I just listen to one channel, although I do have a set of tracks that I've converted to mono. Uh, it's a little tricky converting the things to mono. You may cause cancellations or you may cause clipping. So as a practical matter, you don't have to go 
create mono tracks. Just listen to a lot of, uh, you know, as long as you're using the same track uh, for every speaker you're evaluating or everything you're doing, it doesn't matter. Then it becomes a constant. Okay. Now the last one is what makes it hard for us to do a, a, this because the speakers um, should be in the same location, should be in the same situation. The situation meaning that at least you got level matching and level matching is its own kind of worms. Uh, there are there's some work that's done. It's not the strongest work as far as research and how you match levels, but as a minimum, you want to have a controlled noise that you run and, and with some kind of weighting, uh, averaging, um, you match levels so that they're within the ballparks. Now, I'd say it's not the most solid thing because the frequency response varies between different speakers. And so what are you matching? Perfect matching can't be done, but you can get very close and close enough. So you've got to do that. Um, but the same location thing is very tricky. If you move a speaker in a room, the room modes get activated differently, and that changes the bass response, and the bass response is responsible for one-third of our preference on sound of a speaker. So you've got to be very careful in in not moving a speaker enough where the bass response changes, and therefore you have apples and oranges. Now, this can be done, but you have to then shuffle speakers. So if you have one speaker on the right, one speaker on the, on the left, and you test them, then you got to have a randomized ver uh, set of tests where you sh swap them and then test again, then swap them and test again, swap them and test again. And that sort of uh, randomizes the, uh, uh, the location-specific uh, spectral changes uh, from the speaker, and you can achieve the same thing. And indeed, that's I think how Dr. Tool did it originally. Um, but there, you know, Harman has the fortune, good fortune of having a, a speaker shuffler. So this is the pioneering work that was done, Dr. Tool, in 1980s, and it's continued to this day, and it's the gold standard. There is no other research type of uh, that I know and to preference testing of speaker that's done any differently. And again, nothing like that at what people do as far as subjectives. Now, Dr. Floyd Toole sort of pioneered it, but pioneered this, this game, but his right-hand person is, uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Sean Olive. Um, and I've pasted this his old qualification. He, he's you know, the most qualified person we have as far as practicing the research in here and trying to get to these uh, factors that influence our preferences in, in loudspeakers. He's published countless papers by himself and, and together with other researchers. And uh, he also came from NRC and followed Dr. Tool to Harman. And, you know, if you want to pause the video and you can Google his, on, on his background online, you're welcome to do so. But, you know, there's a name you want to know. Uh, and if a subjectivist reviewer has never heard of uh, uh, Dr. Oliver, or Dr. Floyd Tool, then you sort of, you know, guarantee that they know nothing about the topic. Uh, he's written a lot of papers and done a lot of research, as I mentioned, but I'm going to focus on one research paper um, that uh, this is the title and that's the link if you want to go to it. Uh, differences in performance and preferences of trained versus untrained listeners. Um, Harman has a simple tool you use to train yourself and the training isn't to like certain speaker sound or anything like that. It's a simple tool, it's like a, almost a video game where a track is played and then uh, different regions of it equalize uh, you know, tonality change and your job is to identify you know, which one of the tonality changes it is. And original, uh, initially, at lower levels, it, it makes broad changes, and then it makes the changes smaller, smaller, smaller. And the requirement they have is that you got to reach level seven to be able to be called a trained listener. And in addition, these trained listeners are not only are trained formally in, in this kind of, uh, with this kind of tool and examined and like passing a test and certification, but they also take many of these tests. So they're very familiar in being able to probe and, and focus on the sound um, uh, on this thing, as opposed to, you know, general person, uh, you know, random person, like when I was sitting there the first time, it's like, okay, what's, what's this setup? You know, <laughs> they know the setup and things like that. So the question was, and their marketing people were pushing back on, on Sean saying, okay, well, you know, you're, uh, Chain listeners may have different preference than, uh, you know, average person or different reviewers or different parts of the public, you know, prove to us that that's not the case. So his goal in here wasn't as much to determine, you know, what's the best sounding speaker, but also 
if people from different walks of life, how do they do in these kinds of tests? Uh, do they prefer different speakers? And what is their performance in being able to evaluate speakers? I'm going to warn you um, that this paper is very dense. Uh, typical of journal papers that get published in Journal of Audio Engineering Society, they got to have weight to it. That means uh, half the time, tons of math. In this case, is a huge amount of statistics, st statistical uh, analysis and lingo, and a bunch of references, and they're usually quite long. So while I normally encourage you to go get these papers and read, I don't know if, if you're not a member, I don't know if I want to encourage you to go spend $33 to get this paper, but know that this is, it is heavy stuff. This is not some casual conference paper, which is the up, you know, opposite of this, or, or another way you can publish things at AES, where um, you can write what you want, and normally they're not peer reviewed. They could be, but they're, they're not normally peer reviewed. So um, this is a you know, substantial paper, and this is also, um, um, uh, built on top of work that was done similarly, but older than this, by uh, um, by uh, Dr. Soren Bach, Beck, uh, sorry, uh, who's a researcher, a professor, and also works at uh, Bang & Olufsen's, um, and one of our luminaries as well. His paper is also full of statistics, and uh, so these two sort of go together, although I don't think you need um, Dr. Beck's uh, paper to fully understand this one. So my job in here is to walk you through the parts of this thing that, that are, are important, and, you know, and, and just sort of tell you the, the, you know, the top lines in there. So what is the study? Um, Different groups of people were brought into Harman uh, and tested with the same set of uh, two sets of speakers. In one case was three speakers, in the other case was four speakers. And each one of them were run through the same process. So imagine one day they have their dealers from East Coast coming in and they have them sit through this course and do the scoring and the data was collected. The next day or next week they went and uh, got students from local university and then one of the things they did which we care a lot about here is that they also went and got some magazine reviewers and they tested them and that's the core area that i'm going to focus on in here and they also had 12 of their own trained listeners um you're welcome to read the rest of this this is the abstract summary that's on the website that you can get for free but i'm going to dig into what these things mean um, but it's really comparison of these different groups and how they did in the research. One key thing they did in here, which is kind of clever, and you don't normally see it in, in these type of research papers, is that this test is uh, testing multiple factors simultaneously. So we're not just saying, looking at, okay, these four speakers, which one sounds better? That's one factor. The next thing we're also looking at is different listener groups, and there were a huge number of listening groups, uh, you know, in this thing. I think there were 12, 16 different listener groups, and it was across two different tests. And uh, so it's not, you can slice and dice this test in many different ways, and you want to step back and say, all right, ultimately, what was the biggest factor that determined, uh, uh, you know, the uh, that had a uh, biggest var uh, variable in all these things? Now, ideally, we want the only thing to be a variable is the speaker, that the listeners were interchangeable with each other, right? Then that way it doesn't matter who we use for listening tests, the results will be determining the fidelity of the speaker. Thankfully, the uh, loudspeaker did achieve the highest, and there's a specific test that was done in here, and let you read that um, in the paper if you want, but uh, the analysis showed that the uh, loudspeaker was the number one determinant or the most important factor, and the variable was, was considered to be large uh, for loudspeaker. But guess what the next factor was? Was the listening group. That was actually a medium factor, and then the which content that was used was a mild factor. So unfortunately, this means that you pick the wrong listener group. You may actually wind up with different speaker results because they have a you know very large influence on assessment of fidelity of speakers. Uh, if you step back, you know when I use an instrument measure a speaker, I have a precise tool that is very repeatable. When I replace that machine with a person, I want that person to be ideally as good as that measurement uh, instrument. 
But if they have this level of influence on, on the uh, test result, that's not a good thing. Now, how do we determine um, reliability of, of uh, these uh, reviewers? As I said, every one of these groups listened to the speakers and they generated large set of data as far as the, the scoring that they gave. And uh, in a simpler, simplest sense of their layman means, you know, you would think, okay, I'll just take the average of these things and they'll tell me, you know, how good the, uh, um, the speaker is. But there's a problem with that in that there is a variability in the opinions of, of, of these testers in how they rate a speaker. Um, you know, when I, as I mentioned, the tests are randomized. So I listen to speaker A when it's played first and I give it five as a score when it's randomized and I don't know when it comes up again. And this time I give it a score of seven. The next time I give it six. So there's variability even for the same score. Now you could get the mean for all these things or the average uh, on these things. And you may think, okay, a speaker that has a mean of uh, five is uh, worse sounding than a, score, than a speaker that has a mean of six. That may make lay um, um, sense, but it's actually not correct because the, there can be a statistical error in that uh, sample that we have. Uh, let's say I'll pick totally on you know, people that don't know what is a good speaker and what's a bad speaker, and they do this you know, voting I don't want to just take their value, you know, their their mean or their average and say, let me run with it. I want to look at the variability in their voting and based on that, decide what is the likelihood that what they're, how they're scoring the speakers is actually correct and it's not due to chance and due to variation. Now, there's an entire field of uh, statistics called the ANOVA or analysis of variances. Um, each one of these groups in, in here that I have for you, they all have variances within um, their scoring. And um, you know, I'm not gonna try to teach you the statistical concepts in here, but essentially you can take the variances and analyze them and decide whether the variances are enough to be a showstopper or that they're telling the truth. And usually we pick a confidence interval. In this case, I'm showing you a 5% confidence interval, which means we are 95% um, a chance of being correct in the conclusions that we want to draw. And the conclusion we want to draw in this case is that speaker A is better than speaker B and worse than speaker D. And these are their scores. So as part of ANOVA, you, you do a special analysis called the F value, which is a ratio that you take, which is a difference between the means of different groups and then uh, to the, and you divide that by the variances within your own group. And uh, the, the more variances you have within your group, uh, the more you drag down this F value and the lower the F value, the higher probability of chance that that makes the results unreliable. And if you look at the F, this ratio distribution is sort of front loaded. So if you got a two out of it, you know, and that ratio for that F value for that speaker rating, you're way below the confidence that we want to have in here. So the farther you are, the bigger the, this F value, the more you push to the right of this curve, and the more you push that to the right of the curve, the less doubt we have that you really, really were able to detect the differences between the speakers, and it wasn't something by chance, and it wasn't just randomness that, that uh, got you here, uh, was that, that, that we have high confidence in the results. So uh, Sean Olive took um, these different uh, sets of reviewers that came in and, and bucketed, the, the, computed their F value for every uh, that person that was in that category and just simply took the, uh, the mean or the average of them. And uh, the, uh, their trained listeners got a score of about 94.6. And for the purpose of marketing, he pushed that up to be 100, scaled it up to 100. So relative to them, the next group that did well was way worse. And this is their dealers, the audio retailers. And you can see their reliability is way the heck worth it was about 30 or so. Now it's still statistically valid in, in that they were able to, uh, there were differences in the loudspeakers so we can use their scores, but their reliability was worse. And who's worse than them even? 
audio reviewers. These are professional audio reviewers and look at their score in here. They're around 20. So they're about a five to one ratio between these two groups as far as the trained people and untrained people. What does that mean in practice? <coughs> Excuse me. In order to get data from audio reviewers to be as good as what we can get with trained listeners, we have to use a lot more of them. And once we have a lot more of them, then the variance falls out of them and, and the data becomes more reliable. The fewer audio reviewers you have, the higher chances of randomness and not being able to distinguish between statistically distinguishing between speakers. So just imagine if this thing shrinks down to one, which is single reviewer writing in a magazine, what are the odds of that being statistically valid in their opinion? So it would be way down here, it would be completely useless uh, on this thing. So this is the power of training and you know it's, this is the data that's just extensively analyzed. So this is not just some, you know, what thumb in the air saying, hey, I've been doing this for 25 years, so I know what I'm doing. And, uh, and that's what I just explained, that the, uh, the trained people, again, all they were trained on is to just know the tonality of speakers. You know, if that's too much bass or too much mid-range and what band, that's all the training was for the trained people and some experience taking these tests. It's five times better than reviewers and 27 times better than students. Uh, but the problem with students was that they liked everything. So, which is, you know, something uh, that we can appreciate that, you know, to them a big, nice high five system just sounds good. And uh, this is a damning statement and that these reviewers are actually worse than dealers and the salespeople in a showroom that you go on. Most of us, you know, scoff at listening to a salesman or the audio retailer telling us what sounds good, what doesn't. And yet these people did even worse than that. Um, why? It's hard to know. Maybe, it's, you know, they have more opportunity to get trained and they have more opportunity to play with equipment in, in more control setting. I don't know. But um, certainly this, is, this does not bode well for uh, magazine reviewers pumping their chest and saying, hey, I know what I'm doing. Now, you know, we get back to this common myth that we all like, we all have different taste. We do not. Remember, there are some 256 people were tested in this study uh, across many different walks of life. And you can see all these different labels that Harmon's given to them as far as which group they were in the academia. And then we have the reviewers here circled. Um, this is the Harmon one. And there are other ones in here that I'm not going to get into, the dealers, for example, and so forth. But look at the, the way they scored the speakers in here. Uh, look at the speaker in green, M um, speaker. Uh, Look at the scores that the uh, uh, that it got was the worst one across any group. So whether it was uh, students or whether it was reviewers or whether it was Harmon people to were trained, all of them gave Speaker M the worst uh, rating in control blind tests. Um, so the preference of all of these people was the same. Now, what did the trained listeners do? Gave it horrible scores. Right, they said this is a terrible, terrible speaker. So the trained people ha have less tolerance for bad sound. They immediately spot it and they give it, you know, close to zero score in here. And with almost no variance on on this thing. Um, the next speaker was this B speaker again. You know, you can see that the var there are variables between who tested it, but as far as ranking, is the next good speaker, right? It's the one that's above M speaker, but no matter who took it. The score is always above green and is always below these last two speakers. The, the, uh, speaking of the last two speakers, the PNI, more or less a statistical tie. Uh, the trained listeners could not tell them apart. They gave them similar preference ratings. And the other two groups, more or less, you know, have a lot of variation in there. And, but t the two of them together took the third place. So first, second, and third. If this, if it were true that we all have different tastes, this thing should have been a jumbled up mess, right? That if, you know, this thing, you know, like the green one, you know, maybe for trained listeners was zero, but for uh, let's say reviewers would give it number one and it would have been way up here. But it's not, it's all orderly stacked charts. In the grand scheme of things, you gotta let your eyes filter these things because again, there are variances in here. You can see the error bars in there. It's not a precise thing in, in, in statistics. 
Okay, so please, please accept this. Now, is it possible that one out of 100 likes different things? Yes, there are people who hate the taste of chicken or they won't eat fish. But uh, most of us like chocolate ice cream, like a steak, like similar things. And uh, that makes sense that the same thing applies to speakers. Otherwise, it's a crazy world out there where the, anything goes. Um, the most important part, and this is repeated in so many studies uh, that are published by Harmon and NRC and Dr. Uh, Floyd Toole and, and Dr. Alu, is this correlation between measurements and speakers. And this is a fascinating assessment. It's a, it is from a presentation, by the way, different than the study that I was just showing you. Um, if you look at these two speakers, you can see one that's very, very well behaved, this loudspeaker too. Look at the frequency response, quite smooth, not perfect, but quite smooth. And look at this other speaker, very, very jagged response with, with a Twitter response, much hotter than the rest of it. They, uh, Harman took these trained listeners and had them rate this on specific bands. I think there were six bands uh, of, of tonality and had them rate, you know, is the tonality neutral? That would get a zero. And if the tonality was bad or, you know, it would get a score down and up. And look at what happened when they did that for this speaker. Look at the line that they produce. It's almost the same as the frequency response. So that they were, they, uh, trained listener was able to work as a crude spectrum analyzer and correctly identified the uh, tonality of the speaker as being essentially doesn't have enough bass, which we know it doesn't, you know, you need a subwoofer to get that zero, you know, down to 20 hertz, but above 80, 90 hertz, they essentially say it's good. And then look at this speaker. It also doesn't have bass, but the, you know, the response from here to here in lower mid range also terrible. And then look at this, they also, uh, produced, you know, they correctly guess that the speaker is too bright. So this tells us that A, training works, but B, we can also use measurements instead of people because they speak the same language in here. So if you look at it, they uh, tested this across 13 speakers, and this is the mean as far as the correlation between listening test results and uh, uh, and the uh, measurements, and it's 95%. That's incredibly good. So this points to A, training is very good, but B, also measurements are very good in, in trying to uh, predict what the human ear will hear, uh, with correct measurements. So what's our summary so far? And apologies for this getting long, but <laughs> It's got to be a long presentation, but we're getting closer to the end. Um, just like any other profession, training works. Um, you know, you don't become an athlete because you keep reading books about, you know, how fast you can run. You run and you have a coach that teaches you that, you know, maybe there's a, you know, you uh, compete and against others and so forth. So it's no wonder that there's a professional process to get trained. And if you haven't been through that, then you're not trained. The years of experience thing, the chest pumping thing, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years, must be doing something right. No, it doesn't mean anything because we just tested you when we know the results, where we have a superior group to you, evaluating an identical speaker in an identical situation, and their variation in scoring is like this, and your variation in scoring is way the heck out here. When you listen to the same speaker, it comes around second or third time, you're not able to rate it the same way with the same, you know, close in values which means you're all over the map. So the, your 20, 30, 40 years of experience didn't do you a lot of good. Yeah, you're better than maybe general public, but not nearly as much as you think. So um, from my point of view then, this basically writes off listening to a single reviewer giving me an opinion about a speaker. There's nothing they're doing right at all whatsoever. They're not in control situation. They're not listening to mono. It's not done blind and they're not trained and they're just one of them. You know, a lot of times they brag, well, so and so a bunch of people kind of agree with me. Yeah, fortune tellers can read your fortune too and make you think, you know, that they can read your fortune, but we all know they can't. And so, you know, that chance agreement, especially if you write vague things in, in English, <laughs> as the typical reviewer is, uh, yeah, you can get people to agree with you, but it's not right. But importantly, 
measurements are really, really, really powerful. The good ones, the good measurements, and we'll get into that. So I've been talking about this, but let me just bring you, you know, if you don't want to listen to me, listen to the guy that pioneered this. Um, there's a video here with Aaron, with uh, Dr. Floyd Tool. And around uh, 15 minutes or so, 14 and a half, 15 minutes, um, the discussion, Dr. Tools is this, the, uh, uh, explaining this notion of you need more than one speaker to listen to, to be able to make a judgment. And, uh, you know, it comes out and, and there's an exact quote, says, comparative listening is critical to forming accurate subjective impressions. That means comparing more than one speaker against each other, not just listen to one. And he just comes out and says, look, and if you're listening to just one speaker, it essentially almost means nothing. It goes on to say, maybe you can say what tune it was <laughs> in this thing, on this thing, but it really doesn't tell you anything accurate. So the notion that, hey, I'm gonna go, you know, set up speakers in my home and I can give you unbiased opinion about the thing, is like, no, you're giving me garbage opinion. That's what research tells us for 40 years. If we could do it the way reviewers do, we would do it in research. What's easier than bringing a person sit in front of a stereo speakers and say, what do you think, score one to 10? Oh, okay, next person, next person. Why run through these randomized control tests and blind and everything if we didn't need to do that? We do them because we have to. Pain in the neck to do a four-way comparison of speakers versus one. If I want to compare one speaker, then I don't have to shuffle anything. But we have to, it's just the nature of the thing. The worst one is this take-home version. Um, I do this all the time, you know, I listen to a, uh, I take a headphone, I measure it, and I equalize it, and I still have certain experience. Then I leave it on for a few hours, I'm listening, then I turn off the EQ. It's amazing how my ears had adapted to that as being the new normal. And then you hear this impressive change at that time that's much larger than if you were doing it at the beginning of the session. Um, because your, your ears adapt to these things. And indeed, even the worst speakers, you'll adapt, and if they're too bright, that becomes your new reference, it's your new normal, to use a common phrase now. And the longer you use a speaker, the worse your impression of that speaker is as a reviewer. So don't tell me that you took this home and you spent a week and two weeks, three weeks. Oh man, I really work on these reviews. I listen to thousands of tracks and everything. And then, then, then after three weeks, tell you what it's like. I mean, he tests the speaker in one day and he comes tells me what it sounds like. It can't possibly be correct. Like, no, you want you to, to not have adaptation. We're you know, our brain designed to adapt. You live in your home, you adapt to uh, acoustics all the time. Otherwise you'd be bothered like heck <laughs> as you move around in different parts of your, uh, your room. Your brain is learned to adapt, to adapt to your environment. And it just filters out consistent uh, coloration to some extent. So if it's always bright, it says, okay, that's always bright. It's not new information. I'm not going to keep recapturing that as, as, as useful thing. So don't believe me, queue up this video, go to a minute 15, listen to it. I'd encourage you to listen to the whole thing. Um, disappointed that Aaron asked him this question and then he still advocates listening to speakers in his home and before the measurements, and he's proud of the fact that he uh, doesn't look at measurements, therefore they must be more scientific as a single person tester. Uh, Aaron's a good guy, but I'm just telling you, it's, there's nothing scientific about a Zyda test of putting two speakers in a room uh, and listen to it. I don't give you that impression. Well, actually I do. I give you a mere version of okay or not okay, but I wouldn't in a, in a million years try to prove to you that that's, that's a correct assessment because it isn't. You have to do a multi-way uh, test. And if you're not doing this multi-way test, you're not randomizing it, you're not controlling the volumes and so forth, you're really generating garbage. It's not a reliable assessment. So where do we go? So if listening tests are pain in the neck, they're difficult, next to impossible to do at home, what should a reviewer do? By golly, start with measurements because I just explained four years of research says, the correct measurements, these spinoramas that we, we, I show you at Audio Science Review, these are highly predictive of our preferences. And the number one thing I look at, and research tells you, is that you look at on axis, the direct sound that comes to your ear, what is its tonality? If it's all chewed up, 
it's not correct, it's not good. I don't care if you associate more highs as being more detailed and all that stuff. It's just not correct, it'll wear on you. It's just not the way the music was produced. It's not a high fidelity experience. So you want that to be as smooth again. And if you get a speaker that has that and you ignore everything else about it, you're 60% there, 70% there in weeding out a whole bunch of crappy speakers because the tons of speakers are below that, can't achieve that. And the second thing that's extremely important is the off-axis sound, which is the sound that hits the walls and reflects comes to you and the strongest ones of those reflections. And we want that to have similar tonality to the on-axis. Pick those two to be correct in the speaker that you buy and you're 80% of the way there, if not 90 to 100%. You basically weeded out tons and tons of bad designs and bad speakers out there. And that should be your goal. That should be what you want to get out of a review. You're interested in the speaker, I'm reviewing it or somebody else is reviewing it. The measurements will get, throw out 80 to 90% of the unknown about the sound of a speaker for you, hugely increasing your odds that if you go buy that speaker, you're gonna like it because these two factors weed out this stuff. Now, we're anal about this thing. We, I, tell you, I don't wanna stop at 80, 90%, and I wanna to get to 90, 95% if I'm gonna say some speakers good. Let's, let's cover some other holes in the measurements. The number one hole we have, which research just doesn't address, is this dynamic playback capability. Um, all the research uses a standard for loudness, and they said all speakers should have loudness. It's medium level loudness when I've taken the test, and certainly not as loud as I like to turn off the volume. And take powered monitors. Some of them can have incredibly good uh, objective frequency response measurements, but you turn up the volume and the internal amplifier limits and starts to crackle, or the driver's too small and bottoms out and it crackles. I don't need measurements for that. I'm listening to it, all of a sudden I hear crackle. I, I, you know, it doesn't, I, you know, I could show you a thousand distortion charts and I wouldn't be able to show you at the point where the thing is crackling, but my ears instantly tell me I don't need a blind test, I don't need control tests, I don't need anything, it crackles. You <laughs> doubt me, come sit next to me, I'll turn it on. It'll crackle. When it crackles, is either loud enough or is it loud enough? Now, that's subjective, and I tell you that I like it loud, and, I, and it's good. As a reviewer, I set it up, set the bar high. By the way, I don't listen to loud music all the time or even much vast majority of the time. But occasionally, I want to have, be able to turn up the volume, and I want that to scale up linearly, not to bottom out. It's like a car. You want to accelerate and pass another car. You don't want the car all of a sudden to tell you, no, no, I don't have enough power. I'm sorry, you're on your own now. It's like, no, if I want to accelerate and pass somebody, I want to do whatever speed and acceleration I want to have. Same speakers. So I hold a very high standards for dynamic capability. Now, that doesn't mean that I'll take a three inch speaker expected to get super loud, but I expect everything to at least reach a level of competence. And the higher end the speaker is, the, the, the better it be in that. So. That one is an easy, low-hanging fruit, and I'm saddened that no reviewer does this. I mean, read the typical subjective reviewer. When does he tell you how loud he could play it, and how did it get distorted? I have specific tracks of music I use that has deep bass and a sub bass in it that just instantly brings the speaker to his knees if it's not tuned right and doesn't have enough power. It's got sub bass response from 20 to 30 hertz. And by the way, I have a ton of tracks that have spectrum in 20, 30 hertz. I don't know where this myth comes from that it's not common. There's tons and tons of music out there. Maybe in the old days that you bought records or you listened to you know, 20 tracks at home, you didn't have it. But now with you know, music subscription, it's so easy to just cycle through so much music. And as I listen to it, I have a spectrum analyzer on my RME ADI2 DAC. And I, I hear it and I you know, listen to it with headphones usually and see the spectrum shooting up you know, uh, in the first or second bars in this thing. And I collect these tracks and it's just child's play. Play them, boom, and low volume's okay. And by the way, some of them don't reproduce it, which could be plus or minus, and I'll note that. Now, that's the easy part. Again, people don't do it, but that's the easy part. The second one is harder, which is I have a frequency response and uh, it's not perfect. This is a Genelec 8338 that I just tested recently. And it's extremely good speaker compared to many, but it's got this little bit of a peaking that comes up here during the crossover region and tiny bit over here. And how significant is that? Now, people who advocate all measurements 
we'll have trouble with this. What is the response of this thing? I, I mean, I could guess and say, oh, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 hertz had a little bit more energy. And by the way, some people cheat and write reviews that way. They claim to not have looked at the measurements, but they're very specific about what the problem is, 2,000 through 3,000. Like, yeah, right, you know, you didn't look at the measurements. Of course you look at the measurements. There's no way you're that accurate uh, in knowing where the problem areas are. Um, but, you know, I'm transparent with you. And I say, yeah, this probably is audible. This 3, 4 dB over here, but it's kind of chewed up and variation. It's not like it's a steps up and steps down. You know, our hearing resolution of our hearing, um, the bandwidth of auditory filters widens. So in a sense, it's filtering, averaging these peaks and troughs, and maybe it's averaging this with this, and we don't know it. So what I do is that... Uh, I come up with a process that it just works so beautifully and been doing it you know, since I started, which is I'll take this frequency response and go develop a parametric EQ and I do the inverse of this. So in this case, I designed a filter and I, you know, I was quick and dirty. It doesn't have to be precise. I designed a filter and took this entire range and just dropped it 3 or 4 dB. And once I did that, in my uh, rune player where I have this parametric EQ, I can just, I just turn that filter on and off instantly. On, off, on, off, on, off. And uh, I can do that instantly. Whereas when I was listening to Har uh, the Harmon, the speaker shuffle takes four or five seconds. That's like a long time compared to this. This is very fast. And the fastest switching time is the more your short-term memory is active and the better judgments you can make. So I'm able to check very small variations in, in uh, frequency response and do it quickly. And sometimes I say, okay, this sounds better, but boy, the difference is very small. Let me do it blind. I close my eye and I click the mouse enough time where the thing gets randomized. And then I then evaluate it's A, B, A, B, A, B, which one's better than I open my eyes and look at it. And by the way, I can do it for other people. I've had my son, when he's here, he listens. Uh, usually it's headphone testing where I do this with him. Listens to headphone and A, B testing the equalization of one band or more bands and say, all right, you know, what's your preference? Don't tell him anything about anything. He can also turn away, not even look at it. I've done it blind on him. Where I do A and B and A and B and say, okay, which one you like better? And you get a fully objective control test. Um, I do volume adjustments, sometimes necessary, by the way, uh, control and volume. Um, so everything that the, per, uh, the standard requires, I'm able to do for free. Instantly, I can do this. Now, one of the cool things about this is that is this, uh, well, let me, I'll come back to the second. This kind of method of using equalization is a huge part of Dr. Sean Aller's headphone research. Early on, he realized that if you take a headphone and you want to do A-B tests, people can tell from the feel of the headphone uh, which one they're listening to. And that was a dead giveaway. So the person said, oh, this is the one with the big pads, so I'm going to give it a score of this. So instead of doing that, they took a surrogate headphone. They took one headphone and measured its frequency response. Then they measured the frequency response of all the other headphones they wanted to test and electronically activate them on top of this. So they did the difference between them and it make this chameleon headphone sound like the other ones. They also tested the EQ version of this headphone against the real one, and they found about 85% correlation between the two. So good enough for this kind of research. And, and amazing, you take the identical headphone, depending on how you EQ it, you get a score of zero, or bottom of the barrel to a score of 10 on top, and all you've done is change the tonality. So using equalization is absolutely correct and scientific way to make evaluations. Now, it hasn't been applied to speakers like I'm doing it, but I think it's, it's the very, very, very powerful thing. I've tested about 166 speakers, not over 25 years, over two years. So I get to practice this day in, day out. Every two or three days, I'm either testing a headphone or I'm doing a speaker, and I'm telling you, this, this process of developing equalization and doing A-B testing is exceptionally powerful, exceptionally solid way of evaluating frequency response errors. And if you find frequency response errors that can be corrected with the EQ, guess what you have? You have a nice um, EQ model now to make the speaker more perfect. I can make speakers jump one, two, or three points in scale one to 10, with just equalization, I've taken a clip speaker that was so bright, but had good directivity, meaning on and off axis work the same, and brought it down to make it a very accurate speaker. 
and with zero cost. Didn't have to go mess with the crossover. There's this guy, GI Research, Danny goes in there and rips apart the speaker and puts all new crossover in there. Why? Unless there's a specific issue that crossover uh, can fix. If it's just tonality, I can do things you can't dream about doing inside a crossover. I can take any frequency, any width, any shape, and make a correction. Trying to do that with an EQ, with inductors and resistors and capacitors. Every one of those bands, you have to put a bunch of filter network in there and have poor accuracy and variation. Use equalization. Equalization's absolutely, absolutely powerful. So we get into the end of <laughs> one hour presentation. So start from the top. If you're doing a one-off review of a speaker, I'm sorry, but there's just nothing about your assessment of the sound of the speaker is scientific, reliable, or something you can rely on. You know, appeal to lay intuition. I've you know reviewed speakers for so many years. It really means nothing. It just that's the nature of the game. Now, subjective reviewer talking about the design of the speaker, look of it, and history of it, the cost of it, all that is valuable information that I wish they would just focus on that, not screw around with trying to tell us, you know, how the world turns. And by the way, the moment they start using different pieces of music with every speaker, that's also when you give up. I use the exact same tracks all the time because your ears get trained, you know, you know what the tonality of that track should be, and not this thing of it becomes a music discovery. You want to tell me about the for music, write an article about that. Um, if you're a professional reviewer or, uh, magazine and you want to do right, lead with the measurements. Don't make it a little footnote at the end, push it down to a little section of it. Um, uh, on this thing. Uh, it's just a shame how, how far either the measurements have been erased out of these professional reviews or they've been relegated to afterwards. You know, here's the measurement and the poor measurement guy gets the results and then he has to make sense of, you know, how the subjective reviewer put his foot in his mouth. And a lot of times they have to be politically correct. So it, it's just tough. It should be the other way around, just like I do in my reviews. Measurements are first. Let's analyze that. Let's see what it uh, tells us. Then we get into a subjective listening. We verify what we've done in measurements, determine the impact of things that in, we have in the measurements, and cover things that we don't do, like you know, listening to the uh, dynamic capabilities and so forth uh, on this thing. And the key to all this thing is equalization. Equalization, I can't tell you what a miracle this is in this context and in a larger context, which I'll cover later on. So. This method is working for me. Um, I can defend my results. There's a foundation to everything I'm doing. As you've seen, I'm showing you research, I'm showing backup. It isn't just gut feeling that, hey, if I just listen to these speakers and I can tell you the sound or, you know, not looking at the measurements of good things like, no. By definition, everything I do <laughs> relies on measurements. My job is to make measurements more accurate through listening tests. It isn't to have a completely different universe for measurements versus uh, listening tests. No, the, listen, the measurements are so good and so accurate. We just want to add a layer on top and, and complete them. We're not trying to present you with an entire different universe that's based on zero science and say, hey, now it's up to you to deal with the conflict in here. It's like, no, you give me junk science over here. I'm not going to listen to that. It's just nonsense. It's entertainment. You know, I watch those subjective reviews. Many of them do a great job. They're nice, you know, well-liked people. It's entertainment and it's informational. You know, what the speaker is, who makes it, what have you. Those are all good information to have. But telling me that, you know, this track you listen to and these, you know, the guitar and this other instruments should be more separate than they are. And everything. it's just all folklore. It's just not worth um, dealing with. So that's where I am with this thing. Uh, hopefully you see the logic in it. Hopefully you won't ask again. Do you look at the measurements or not? By the way, when I first turned on the speakers or headphones, I'm not looking at any measurements at all. I just listen just like you would. Maybe I have a vague idea of them in my head, but I don't go memorizing those graphs either. I listen and I do form an opinion very quickly, but I'm not going to publish that opinion to you. I'll go develop it. Then I'll look at the measurements. I applaud the equalization. And in case of that general X speaker, I decided the EQ wasn't doing much. Uh, there was a toss up. And I said, you don't even need to EQ it. Um, but if you like, you can. You have the data. You can judge whether you have to do it or not.
Okay, thanks for uh, watching this very long video. Hopefully you got uh, something out of it. Uh, apologize for the length of it. I, I don't know how to make this topic any shorter than this and cover all this material. Even if you don't care about this whole reviewer bit, hopefully you understand how proper listening tests are done and what is the right way to uh, assess the performance of a speaker. Okay, see you in a future video, hopefully a much shorter one. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.